Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, to the second of the two presentations that we're doing today at Senator Spilka's wonderful event here. Uh, and you, if you talk to her, thank you to Senator Spilka. I think this is just a really important way for a lot of seniors to get a lot of information about a lot of stuff. Uh, what we're going to talk about is a very important topic to a lot of folks. Uh, it's dealing with uh, a loved one, dealing with it yourself, but especially dealing with a loved one who has dementia. Uh, especially, and we talked in the first session about early stages of that and recognizing it and what's reversible and what isn't and what you can do. And now we're talking about a more difficult situation. We're talking about my friends Frank and Mary. Whenever I do presentations at Councils on Aging, I'm always talking about Frank and Mary. Um, they have three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They, their goal in life is to be buried, to stay in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. They own a home. They've got some assets. We're going to talk about assets and asset shifting a little bit. Um, and Mary Jr. is the, the designated daughter, right? A lot of people end up with a designated daughter. Very seldom a designated son. So that's the one who's going to kind of take care of things as, as people get older. Uh, and, and their problem right now is that Mary, who has been um, OK living at home, has gotten a lot of support, has gotten home care, has gotten all kinds of things, but has dementia. It's progressed. As we all know, dementia is, goes only in one direction. You're not going to get better from most kinds of dementia. And now she's at the point where something else has to happen, and she needs to be, be, be doing something else. Either there needs to be a tremendous amount of support at home, uh, or she needs to go to a nursing home, or she needs to go to assisted living. So I'm going to start off by talking about the worst one. I started doing this work in 1991 after my mother died in a nursing home. I watched this play out with my dad and her getting worse, and hiding basically, and nobody coming to the house, and my father getting angry, and my mother getting apathetic. And it was just all, it was the, all the stuff, the whole thing. And at that time, really, when all, and Alzheimer's wasn't in the, di in the lexicon kind of at that time, right? You were just kind of getting old. Uh, and at that time, nursing home was really the only option. Um, there weren't assisted living facilities. There weren't a lot of services available in the home. You just kind of, you know, you kind of, and no one understood how to deal with the disease. So now there really are three possibilities. You can stay at home, uh, or you can go to a nursing home when things get really serious, or you can go to assisted li living, not in the usual assisted living, but increasingly assisted livings have memory care units in them. And I asked Eric Kessler to, to come today to talk to you about a really wonderful one that's in Marlboro, although there are a number of them in a number of facilities where you've got um, kind of an alternative to nursing homes for folks who, who are really having a hard time and don't have the, the, the family and support to be able to stay at home. So I'm going to talk about all of those. One, so Frank and Mary, uh, they have assets, they have a house that's worth $300,000. They have an IRA, he does, worth $200,000. Uh, they have savings that are about $300,000. Their total assets are $800,000. Uh, Frank has total income of uh, $2,250 and Mary of $750, so they have income of $3,000 a month. Uh, Mary, if Mary needs to go to the nursing home, show of hands, how many people think that they're going to have to spend a lot of this money down before she can qualify for Mass Health and have Mass Health pay for the nursing home care? How many people think she's gonna, they're going to need to spend a lot of money here before they can do it? Um, if you do, you're wrong. And briefly, the reason for that, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a, a little brief piece. This is going to come up later on, but I just want you to remember this. The activities of daily living. The activities of daily living are relevant to a lot of programs. Among other things, if someone can't and needs physical assistance with two of these, dressing, eating, toileting, bathing, transferring, that means for mass health purposes, they're eligible for nursing home care, which means if they're in the nursing home, that if they're financially eligible, that MassHealth will pay for the nursing home care above what the income is of the person in the nursing home. So the question then is, if they're in the nursing home, 
Um, can Mary be financially eligible? Well, for her to be financially eligible, she has to have countable assets of less than $2,000. Ooh, that's not very much. They have more than that. But, but Frank can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $814,000. So in this case, he can own the home. He can have cash or cash equivalents, uh, things that can turn into cash, of $117,240. Of course, he has more than that. But that's quite a bit. A lot of people actually have less than that. But most importantly, he can have infinite income. Infinite income. So what Frank would do in this case, I'm not sure if I've got a, yes, what Frank can do in this case, it, uh, as long as Mary has given Frank or someone a power of attorney to allow someone to sign her name, Frank can shift all the assets to Frank, take all the assets that are over $117,240 and buy an annuity. What is an annuity? It is a, a contract between an individual and an insurance company. You give them money. In return for that, they give, they give you a promise that they're going to give you back that money plus some interest in monthly payments over a term. As long as the annuity that Frank buys is for a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, which if he's 80 years old, for example, his life expectancy would be about eight years, um, the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. And he can have infinite income, infinite income. So the day after he purchases that annuity and the other assets have been shifted to him, Mary's eligible for mass health, right? So for the, all those people who thought they had to give all their assets away and wait five years, that is incorrect as long as you're married, right? There are problems if, if your spouse has died. I often have people come in, my husband just died, I want to do some planning regarding you know, saving my assets. Well, that's harder because then you do have to give things away and wait for five years. But you don't in this case. Now, the only problem in this case, the only problem is, well, what happens if Frank dies and he's got all these assets? Because remember their plan, their estate plan is uh, Frank's giving everything to Mary, Mary's giving everything to Frank, and when they're both dead, they're going to give everything to the kids. Well, that's a problem here because if Frank dies, now Mary has way more than $2,000, all of which has to be spent down except the house. The house is an accountable asset. But then she'll qualify for Mass Health, and Mass Health will put a lien on the house to recollect after she dies. They can avoid all that. All they have to do is Frank has to change his will. Frank has to change his will so that it says, when I die, I want all my assets to go in trust for the benefit of my wife. I can make Mary the trustee. I can make one of my other kids the trustee. <clears throat> as long as he does that, if he dies, all those assets are immediately safe. They're not countable for mass health purposes. The money can be used by the trustee to supplement Mary's care, take her out to eat, take her on a trip, you know, get her a better wheelchair, all that stuff. But none of it is countable for mass health purposes, and there is no lien against it when, Matt, when Mary dies. So, so if the issue here is nursing home, then they're OK, as long as they do some things. But the point is, they don't want that. Right? Clients are constantly coming into me, talking to me about what to do about the one alternative that they hate. So the question is, are there any other alternatives? And the answer is yes, there are two. One of them is a memory care unit and an assisted living facility. In, at this point in Mary's life and in her state of health, she really can't uh, live in a, in, a, in a regular assisted living that doesn't have a memory care component. Why? She's going to wander. Right? And, 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 and assisted livings are not locked units. Right? She's going to have other issues that in a regular assisted living unit they don't have the staff to deal with. And most importantly, most importantly, she needs to be with people who are trained to understand what dementia is about and how to treat people with dementia. I, I, back when my mother had it, you know, I, and once again, I saw this play out, and, and since then, I would always, hear, I would always think that there were a, a set of symptoms which are simply symptoms of dementia, right? They are, and you know, you know, this cognitive loss, I can't remember things. There's serious cognitive loss, I can't remember how to brush my teeth, you know. There is fa difficulty following complicated instructions, so there's a whole cluster of things. And then there are these other things, apathy, <laughs> aggression depression, anxiety, all the things you associate with people who have Alzheimer's. This, you know, early stages and you see more and more serious in the late stages. More and more I have become persuaded that that cluster of symptoms is not 
are not inevitable symptoms of Alzheimer's. They are the, re they are the, pe the individuals reacting to their other symptoms, saying, I'm really depressed. I can't remember anything. I can't remember my wife's name. I can't remember how to brush my teeth. Or their anger, because they're displacing some of that and being angry with their spouse, right? Or they're, or they're just anxious all the time, right? Or they're just apathetic. Oh my God, my life is over. I might as well just sit here in my chair. So, the, but, but those things can be dealt with by, no, by having a bunch of caregivers who are around the person with Alzheimer's, who understands these things and understands how to deal with them. Really, a lot of what has happened over the last 20 years since, been, since my mother died was that there has evolved this, this really kind of large uh, set of information about dealing with folks with Alzheimer's, what they're going through, and how to deal with them. What, what is unique about memory care units in assisted living facilities is that's what they've focused on in terms of how they've trained their staff to deal with that. Now, um, I've asked Eric Kessler to come to talk about um, the terrific program uh, that is, that it, in, that's in Marlboro, actually, at the, uh, at the New Horizons uh, Assisted Living Facility. Um, it, they have a parallel program in Woburn and some in New York. So to talk about their program. Now, this is not an ad for them, right? But they're really good. But if you've got a person that's in this kind of situation, you ought to look around and figure out whether this is going to work for them, right? Now, these units, I'll tell you ahead of time, are a little expensive, right? But start off by figuring out whether this would work for them and then figure out whether there are ways that the money can work. And that, once again, I do a whole presentation on how, these, how the finances can work. Among other things, many people in this generation were veterans who served during at least one, one day of war. They didn't even have to be at war. They need to serve during at least one day of war. In that case, that veteran is entitled to as much as $2,000 a month in a benefit if they're in an assisted living facility that is providing these assistances with the activities of daily living and the payment is a bundled payment. In addition to that, payments to, the, to that level of assisted living are tax deductible. So one of the strategies that you can use, and I could go through this in more detail in a longer presentation, one of the strategies that Frank and Mary can use is give away their money to one of their kids, have the kid make the monthly payment to the assisted living facility, and now that's tax deductible to the kid. In the example that I give, I've got a son, Peter, who lives in New York City who is a lawyer, making a ton of money. Uh, his tax rate, his income tax rate in New York, counting federal, state, and local, is 40%, which means if he pays his mother's or his parents' assisted living bill of $100,000 in a year, he gets a $40,000 uh, reduction in his taxes as a result because he's in a 40% bracket. He's paying $40,000 less in taxes. If he's a nice kid and he doesn't just use that money to go to the Bahamas but rather throws it back in the pot for the benefit of his parents, he's now extended the value of his parents' savings by 40%. That's a complicated concept. But all I'm saying is the way you think about assisted livings is first decide whether it would work for the person that you know who has dementia. Go see them. Figure it out. Then talk to some professionals. Don't just talk to your neighbor. Don't just talk to the VA guy downtown. Talk to some professionals and see if there's a way that you can make this thing work. But first you need to be seeing one of these units. So Eric, can we just talk about those units for a yeah, while? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.